And good morning, church. It's always exciting to begin a service with baptism. It is especially exciting when the person getting baptized is excited and ready to go. Amen. This is Judd Judkins, and he wants you to know that he's given his life to Jesus. He, had, he told me a while ago, he said, I've been excited about this all week long. Could not wait. Hey, that'll bless you. Amen. And so we're reminded every time we baptize that it is not this water that saves us. It is the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that washes us clean. And this is a way for us to say publicly that we are identifying with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And so we're excited about Judd today coming to be baptized. My brother, it is an honor and a privilege to baptize you this morning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for the church you give us. Father, more importantly, we thank you for the Savior, Jesus Christ. God, we ask you to let's have a great service this morning. Please speak through our pastor. Let us worship you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said? Amen. Well, good morning, church. It's good to see you on this Lord's Day. Let's all stand together as we've come in to worship this morning. One of the things that struck me today as I was praying and asking God to lead us is uh, I was just so thankful that God makes all things new. Aren't you thankful for that, for that today? In the book of Ephesians, in chapter 4, it says, Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as it is good for building up and it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Aren't you thankful for that word of truth today? That God makes all things new. I hope that you've come here today with a joyful heart and a joyful spirit because there is joy in the house of the Lord this morning. And we're here to speak praises to the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, who is worthy of our worship. Amen. Let's put our hands together this morning.
day and we will be quiet we shout free today in Christ. It's such a joy to worship with our family here at MIMS. As um, Brother Larry already said, if you're a guest, we're so glad that you're here, and we'd love to have an opportunity to meet you this time. So family of MIMS, please turn and find someone you haven't met. Give them a nice warm introduction to MIMS. Come back, and we're going to continue to worship the Lord this morning. Amen. 
put our hands together and thank God today for the blood, the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood today. Oh, we worship you, Father. We bless your name. We find our strength in your name alone. Oh, I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. But you came along And then you put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing better back there to morning to dancing 
How many of you today have seen some times in your life when you have uh, experienced the Lord taking the time when you were in mourning and turning it around? Anybody? Then you know what? We need to, we need to celebrate that today. These different phrases just talk about what we were before God, what we were after God. So I want you to sing this out, just this one phrase right here. I know some of you are like, man, I need to sit down. <laughs> it's time to stand up and praise God for just a few more minutes, all right? Here we go. You turn morning, ready? You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. You may be seated. Psalm 121 is one of my favorite psalms, and uh, the choir is going to sing that psalm this morning. There's nothing better than singing the Word of God, and this song is straight right out of the Bible, and um, I told them the other day when we were singing this, I said, memorize this. I will lift up mine eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. We need to remind ourselves of that when we go through life because sometimes we're going to be in that, that situation where the morning is there and we want to, we, we're not feeling like dancing. But God will get us through because he says he's our help and our help comes from him. So I want to encourage you this morning, if you're going through a season, maybe it's a dry season where you've been battling don't stop. Don't give up. Because God's not going to leave you in the midst of the storm. Praise the Lord.
shall preserve my soul even forevermore my love my love my love all of my help come 
Is there a person in the house who can testify that he will give you what you need when you need it? Can you say amen? The book of Daniel, if you will go there with me in your Bible, chapter 1, the book of Daniel, chapter 1, and with the Lord's help, we will conclude chapter 1 today and pick up where we left off last week. Daniel chapter 1, thank you guys for leading us today as we worship the Lord and honored the Lord. Would you stand as we honor the reading of God's Word? Daniel 1, verse number 8. Daniel 1, verse number 8. Who's glad to be in church today? Say amen. 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 I've been uh, dealing with allergies, I think just like everyone, and uh, they, they've got me on uh, special medicine. There's two horrible side effects. One, I get real thirsty. Two, I lose all track of time. Who knows what I mean? <laughs> Don't go get me water. I'm having a little fun, all right? Amen. <laughs> They've been working on that problem for years, and unfortunately, there's no solution. Daniel 1, verse number 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. Why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. So Daniel then said to Melzar, uh, that name means an apprentice or a foreman, really a foreman, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, prove your servants, I beseech you, ten days. Let them give us pulse to eat. Now, now pulse, most would agree, uh, vegetables. And so you would say, well, these people were vegetarians. But, but it also, it was a word that included grains. And so they had pulse to eat and water to drink. And let our countenances be looked upon before you and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as you see, deal with your servants. So he consented to them in the matter, and he proved them 10 days. So in other words, Daniel said, look, I'm going to give you a plan here. Uh, for 10 days, what I want you to do is give us this diet, and you allow the others to continue with their diet. And at the end of the 10 days, you know, you put us to the test, put them to the test, and let's just see what happens. So at the end, of, verse 15, at the end of 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children that did eat the portion of the king's meat. So Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink, and he gave them pulse. In other words, the test passed, and they were vindicated. And as these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now, at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like unto Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding. Now, where did they get that? Can I tell you, they did not get it from the Babylonian college. They did not get it from the Babylonian school. They went there, and they studied, and they learned the astrology and the science and the law and all of the things that they were required to study and to learn in the Babylonian school. But when it came time for the test, the reason they were fair, the reason they they were smarter. The reason they excelled in wisdom was not because of their education, but because of the divine favor of God and because of the goodness of God and God's hand on their life. Because in all manners of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them, so he's putting them to the test, and he found them to be ten times better than all of the magicians and astrologers that were in all of his realm. And Daniel continued even into the first year of King Cyrus. So in other words, he was there for the 70-year Babylonian captivity, uh, people disagree over how old he was when he went there. Some would say 13, some say 15, some say 17. He was a teenager, and he was there for 70 years. So depending on whether it's 13, 15, or 17, you take that at 70 years. He was 83, 85, 87, somewhere nearing the age of 90 when it was all over, and he went there, abducted. He went there as a child, forced to travel 700 miles to this foreign land. He was stripped away from all that he knew and brought out of a godly culture and placed into a godless culture culture where he had to learn the godless idols and all of the philosophies of the Babylonian culture and he lived in Babylon but he never became Babylonian who in the room is listening and Daniel teaches us today ladies and gentlemen how if you'll honor God God will honor you and this young man went from where he was to be in the second in command of the largest empire in the world and I'll hear, I'm here to tell you the same can happen in your life and my life hear me I'm not talking about you're the head not the tail I'm talking about this 
this. If you'll honor God, God will use you to influence the culture that is around you instead of allowing the culture that is around you to infiltrate you and to control you. You see, if we're going to make a difference, then we're going to have to be different. Heavenly Father, for your glory and honor, speak your word to our heart. We love you. We honor you. We adore you and thank you for all that you're going to do. Now, have your way in this place. And we are thankful today to know that Satan is a defeated foe. Satan, you have no right here. And in the name of Jesus, we take authority over every demon of hell. And we plead the blood of Christ on these grounds. And we recognize that we're on holy ground because, Lord, you are here. And we honor your presence. And we thank you in advance for all you're going to do. To God be the glory for great things that he's doing. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said amen. And you can be seated today. Hallelujah. Amen. The book of Daniel. We have seen the shift already in the stage that has been set of a battle that has taken place. God's people had been warned literally for many, many years, for several hundred years to be exact, by the prophets Micah and Isaiah and Jeremiah, that there was going to be a time, watch this, when Babylon was going to invade their land and was going to even take the treasures out of their beloved temple and bring it back to Babylon in order to consecrate it and place it in their pagan temple to the dedication and consecration of their idols and their pagan gods. Unfortunately, the people of God in those days rejected the warnings of God. They rejected the calls to repent, and now judgment is coming. In fact, several hundred years prior to this event, the prophets warned them that this day was coming, and now Babylon is invading Jerusalem. Their king, Jehoiakim, is brought back as a hostage along with others in this first first time to invade this city. There were at least three episodes where they would invade. Daniel was taken during the first invasion and infiltration into the city of Jerusalem. Many historians agree it was around 605 B.C. And it was during the second one that Ezekiel was taken and he was brought back captive. They plundered and pillaged their temple. They brought their Sacrifice, uh, they brought their treasures and treasuries back to Babylon in order to desecrate their temple and make a mockery of their God. In the first seven verses, which is what we spent our time on last week, we looked at the system and the structure and the plan that Babylon uses to infiltrate and to dominate the people of God. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, nothing is new under the sun. The same plan that was used many years ago is used and employed even today. But verses 8 through 21 in this chapter tells another side of the story. You see, it's one thing to talk about Babylon, to talk about the worldly influence that is ungodly and is bent toward against God. But I want you to be reminded that the story of Daniel is not just about Babylon and how it wants to infiltrate our lives. But the story of Daniel is really about a man who was willing to purpose in his heart that he was going to be devoted to God come what may. In other words, he had the attitude, change my name, change my location, change my address, do whatever you want to, mock me, ridicule me, say all of these things about me, make me go to this school, make me learn about your culture, make me change my language, send me to language school and linguistic school, do all of these things in my life, but I will purpose in my heart, come what may, I will not bow, I will honor God, I will stand for God, I will go for God. I'll tell you what we need in this culture are some more men and women like Daniel and his three friends who will purpose in their heart, we're going to stand for God, come what may, regardless of what happens. Our help does not come from this world. Our help comes from the Lord. And though we're involved in politics and we're concerned, we're not going to change this culture politically. We're going to change it when we as the people of God return to God. Hey, I'm going to get stirred up this morning, all right? Amen. Hallelujah. I'm preaching a whole lot better than you're amening. If I got to do the preaching and the amening, we're going to be here twice as long. Amen. Good. Nine of mighty. Help me out, folks. Mm-hmm. Where I come from, they say saying amen to a preacher is like saying sick them to a dog. Who knows what I mean? You see, these verses, the story we read today, tells of Daniel and how he decreed in his heart and purposed in his heart That even though in Babylon, even though in exile, even though in captivity, even though in bondage, he was not going to compromise. You see, you got to understand there's a difference. Don't ever confuse the two between being in Babylon and becoming Babylonian. 
there's a world of difference. For you see, like Daniel, we're all left in this world, but we're not of this world. You see, there is a difference between being a thermostat and a thermometer. You see, many Christians today and churchgoers, they're nothing more than a thermometer. In other words, all they do is register the temperature, but they do absolutely nothing to control the temperature. And they'll say they have convictions, but they'll crumble as soon as they're around a different crowd. You see, you need to recognize there's a difference between being a thermometer and a thermostat. Now, if any of you know what I'm talking about, it takes a high intellect and a high level of skill to control the thermostat in your home. Can I get an amen from anyone? Don't just give it to anyone. You see, a thermometer records the temperature. A thermostat changes the temperature. It's one thing to be in Babylon. It's another thing for Babylon to be in you. You see, Daniel made a difference. But if you and I are going to make a difference, we're going to have to be different. Daniel lived in Babylon, but refused to become Babylonian. How did Daniel impact his culture? How did Daniel change the culture around him? How did Daniel go from being a teenager brought back to Babylon in captivity? How did he go from being in a godly culture with godly values and godly morals and godly people and suddenly overnight he's transported to a godless culture that rejected God and wanted nothing to do? How did he impact the culture around him? Let me give you several things today that he did that we learn in this chapter as we conclude it. Number one, we learn from his life there was determination. In other words, we learn from the life of Daniel, watch, that you and I, if we're going to make a difference, I mean, if we're going to really be a thermostat, not a thermometer, if we're going to live in Babylon, but not allow Babylon to live in us, if we're going to be in the world, not of the world, then we're going to have to understand what he did to make a difference. And what we learn, first of all, in verses 8, 9, and 10, he had determination, Now, notice what it says in verse 8. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, there's some things we've got to study, and let's look at both sides, and let's just go carefully through these verses, and let's learn from the life of Daniel some lessons that can help us in our walk with the Lord. Because I'm going to tell you, even in this room, if we're not careful, there's all different kind of attitudes towards the way we define the world and the way we relate to the world. Some people think the way to reach the world is to totally isolate yourself from the world and you know we'll use verses like come out from among them says the Lord be ye separate touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Absolutely that's in the Bible. How can two walk together except they be agreed? What fellowship does light have with darkness? And certainly those passages are in the Bible. But I'm going to tell you what some people do is they get so isolated that they're never around anyone in the world. And their attitude is sinner, sinner, stay away from sinners, stay away from sinners. And if we're not careful, we develop this us against them mentality. And we think somehow or another that we're the superheroes and all of the others out there are the bad people. But the way I see it according to the Bible is every one of us are bad. The only one's good is Jesus. Can anyone say amen to that? So what are we going to do to reach this world? How are we going to reach this world? Some curse the world. Some condemn the world. Some condone the world. What's the right approach? Daniel teaches us some things. Notice his determination. You're going to change my name? Okay. Call me Belteshazzar. I'm never going to refer to myself as Belteshazzar. Daniel never once did. He didn't protest. He didn't appeal to go see Nebuchadnezzar to fuss. He didn't get a bunch of people outside to protest and say, who do you think you are changing my name? I want you to know I've got my rights. I want you to know my name is Daniel. He just, in his heart, okay, call me what you want to call me. My dad would have said, call me whatever you want to call me. Don't call me late for dinner. Who knows what I mean? Daniel said, you can say I'm Belteshazzar all that you want to, but in my heart, I know my name is Daniel, and I'm going to go by Daniel. And not once in the book of Daniel did Daniel ever reference himself as Belteshazzar. He stayed true to the God of the Bible and to the God that he was committed to as an infant. What's the point? The point is, ladies and gentlemen, when he went in school, he didn't get mad. He didn't fuss. He didn't say, why should I learn this? Some in this room need to hear this. Because God's never called any of us as Christians to be rude and to be crude and to fuss and to cuss. Well, I don't believe I ought to learn this. Okay, I get it and I understand it. I used to, in my mind, always ask that question when we had to work algebra problems. And I'm not trying to be a bad example 
to the kids. I'm just glad God called me to be a preacher. Can I get an amen from anyone? And, uh, but I want you to know, he went to the school. And listen to this. Try this one on. Not only did he go to the school, and not only did he learn what they taught, he excelled. He excelled so much that when he stood before the king and was examined, he was head and shoulders above all of the others. And so the attitude of Daniel was, all right, change my name. Do all of this that you want to, but I'm not going to disobey God. And you need to make sure there's a world of difference between man's rules and God's rules, and all of the people in the house said amen. So the first step he took was determination. You see, they infiltrated, separated, assimilated, manipulated, indoctrinated, and dominated him. And yet Daniel said, I purposed in my heart. The word purpose means to determine, to fix, to resolve. You see, surrounded by people who are concerned none about God or about his word, surrounded by idolaters, here was someone who purposed in his heart and determined and decreed in his heart, I'm going to honor God at all costs, whatever it takes, come what may, regardless of what the rest of the world around me does, I'm not going to compromise, I'm determined. Now notice the place. He says he purposed in his heart. Say that out loud with me. He purposed in his heart. Say it again. Say it again. You see, that's where convictions really are. Everything people believe in, they'll stand for. Everything else is talk. And there is a world of difference between talky-talky and walky-walky. You see, a lot of churchgoers are like an Alka-Seltzer. Who remembers Alka-Seltzer? There's a big plop-plop and then they fizz-fizz. Who knows what I mean? And I'm here to tell you, listen... His determination was in his heart. It was inward, not outward. It was internal, not external. It was not rules. It was relationship. You see, if we're going to influence the culture around us, we're going to have to be determined in our hearts. You can't get up and see which way the wind's blowing. And based on the crowd that you run with, determine what you're going to do. Daniel determined and decreed in his heart, I'm not going to defile myself. I'm not going to disobey God. I'm going to honor the Lord. What could that have meant for him? Could have meant a lot of things. Certainly could have meant death. Are you hearing me? He could have thought to himself, I'm no good to God dead. These people will kill me if I don't submit. And yet he purposed in his heart. When is the time to commit? Now. Not when you're in the middle of a trial. He was purposeful. He had convictions. He would not. Notice it was an issue of the will, verse 8. You see, if we're going to make a difference, we've said it several times, we're going to have to be different. Daniel was determined. I ask you today, are you determined? Are you determined in your heart regardless of what happens in this culture, regardless of what happens in our nation? Are you determined, come what may? I don't mean to chase a lot of rabbits, but hey, I'd rather chase a live rabbit than a dead idea. It's almost two years ago that dreadful C word came onto the scene in our country. Oh, my goodness gracious, for a while, we thought everyone, if you looked at each other, blood was going to come rolling out of your eye sockets, and you were going to drop dead, yes or no. And I mean, there was so much fear, so much panic, so much chaos, and people always asked, you know, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And my famous answer was, I don't have a clue. I've never dealt with all of this before, but what I do know is what God's called us to do. I know he's called us to pray. I know he's called us to fulfill the Great Commission, and I know he's called us to trust him. And regardless of COVID or pandemic or whatever happens, regardless of government, regardless of politics, and whether a Republican is in the White House or a Democrat, my Bible tells me the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and like rivers of water, he turns it whithersoever he will. It doesn't mean I bury my head in the sand and I don't care. It just simply means this world's not my home. And while I want it to be the best that it can be, and while I want to work to make it the best, because the better it is, well, the better we can have it. But at the end of the day, we're not dying to go to the United States of America. We're dying to go to stand before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And hear me right now. If we're going to make a difference, we're going to have to be different. And we're going to have to purpose in our heart, regardless of what happens, regardless of who wins the next election. I mean, have you noticed? I've been hearing it for years. Every time there's an election, the talking heads on the media will say, the most important election we've ever had in our lifetime. Who's heard that? And we've had about 20 of the most important elections we've ever had in our lifetime. And I'm not telling you it doesn't matter. I think those of you that know me know my heart. 
but I want you to hear what I'm telling you. At the end of the day, pray. At the end of the day, get registered to vote. At the end of the day, go vote. And then get you a Diet Coke. And if you're not on a diet, get a honey bun. And go to bed and trust that when you get up in the morning, regardless of who wins, Jesus is on the throne. He's in charge. He's in control. We look to him. He is, he, yes or no? Yes or no? Stop all this panicking. Stop all this running around, scratching your head, wondering what in the world are we going to do? I want you to understand the point of Daniel is to show us that like Daniel, we're just like him. We're in exile. We're in a foreign land. This world's not our home. And Daniel is being used of the Lord to teach you and me how we can make a difference rather than sitting back and allowing this culture to infiltrate us and control us. Well, Brother Jerry, God's called me to do this, and in order to do this, I've got to go to this school, and in order to go to this school, I've got to get this degree. In order to do what God's called me to do, in order to get this degree, I've got to study some things that I don't want to study. What should I do? Well, probably the best thing for you to do is rather than being a negative Nancy, that's not going to get you anywhere. Are you listening? Get in there, study, roll up your sleeves, be the best student, be on time, turn your work in, get straight A's, make a difference, and understand that at the end, it's not because you study astrology that God's going to favor you. It's because you obey God, and when you purpose to obey God, promotion comes from the Lord. He was determined. Secondly, not only was there determination, there was intervention. Who's still awake? Say amen. Amen. So the Bible says, uh, verse 9, God brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. The prince of the eunuchs said, well, Daniel, I fear the Lord, my king, who's appointed your meat and your drink, and why should he see your faces work worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. What's he saying? I'm under orders, strict orders to make sure you eat the king's meat and that you drink of his wine. And if you don't eat this, What's going to happen is your countenance is not going to be as sharp and as fair as the others, and the king's going to know it, and he's going to require my head. Well, all of a sudden, verse 11, Daniel went to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel and these three guys, and he said, would you prove your servants? Put us to the test, I beseech you. Ten days, give us pulse to eat, water to drink, then come and examine our countenances. Now, there's intervention. Could I say something to you that we need to get this morning? Who in the church is listening? Say Amen. The first principle you've got to learn in these verses is they were gracious. They didn't put it on social media. They didn't air their dirty laundry out in public. They didn't ridicule their boss. They weren't negative. They didn't use force. Is anyone in the room listening? I'm telling you, you will never know the true character of someone until they're told no. You will never know the true character of someone until they do not get their way. You will never know the true character of someone until things do not go the way they want them to. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, it is interesting sometimes when people do not get their way that they pitch a fit. They are a fit pitcher. And I'm telling you, Daniel didn't go and be ugly and be rude and try to ridicule or manipulate. He just said, look, um, here's what we'll do. And did you notice he went privately? Is anyone listening? Is the choir listening today? All you guys listening today? He went privately. This is a good way for you to learn how to work uh, with your employer and with your employees. Are you hearing me? I mean, some Christians, they're just like a bunch of fireworks, man. They're just set off. So he went privately. And he said, look, uh, could, could, could we do this, please? We, we want to honor God. We, we, we want to do what you're telling us to do. We want, we want to comply as best we can. But we can't do this because we'll dishonor God. So would you mind, uh, would, would you let us just uh, eat uh, pulse and water? And, uh, well, he said, you know, I, 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 I got to answer to the king, and he's going to take my head off. So then they went over to this other guy, this foreman. Are you listening? And, and they were nice. They were nice. Have you ever read the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace. Have you ever read them? There's nine fruit of the Spirit, and being a jerk is not one of them. (laughs) Amen. Don't say you're full of God and you're rude at at the office. You're rude to your employer. You say, well, I'm a Christian. Okay. Then you ought to be the best employee. You ought to be the best worker. You ought to be the kindest. You ought to be the... If not, don't say you're a Christian. Because the rest of us are tired of the bad rap. Amen? 
And so they go and, and they say, would you, would you mind please let us do this? And so they were gracious and they were kind. They requested. They went in private. And notice they were given grace. And he said, okay, well, we'll let you go for 10 days. And then what we're going to do is we're going to examine. And here was Daniel's heart. Can I just tell you what his heart was, church? If you and I could ever learn this balance, somehow or another maybe God could use us more in this culture in which we live that's so much like Babylon. God's not called you and me to condone the world. God's not called you and me to condemn the world. God's called you and me to confront the world. And God has called you and me to be a difference maker in this pagan world. And I want to work with you to make this country of which we're a part the best that it can be. But at the end of the day, if we get it to be the best it can be and we miss Jesus, we've missed the whole point. You see, we're in a foreign land. And Daniel's heart was, I want to find a way to make this work. I want to do what you're telling me. But at the end of the day, I, I want to honor God and I'm going to honor God. They acted like gentlemen and God intervened. If you would just be kind and gracious and stand on your convictions, and as my dad used to always say, don't be a bull in a china shop. There's no telling what God may could come through and do on your behalf. But until you've given him every opportunity to intervene, shh, shh, shh. Let him do it. Who's listening? Say amen. amen. Thirdly, third principle of how Daniel changed the culture, there was vindication. Uh, notice verse 15. And at the end of 10 days, their countenances appeared fair and fatter in flesh than all of the children that did eat of the portion of the king's meat. And Melzar, he took away the portion of their meat and wine that they should drink, and he gave them pulse. In other words, he said, well, you can't argue with these results. Who in the room would agree God vindicated them? Who would agree? Who would agree in the room God vindicated them because of their heart to stand for truth? Now, I can hear someone right now in the room. Here you are. You're saying, well, preacher, it's because they were vegetarians. And uh, preacher, it's because they didn't eat meat. And uh, preacher, they had Paul said vegetables. Eat your veggies. And preacher, the reason, have, have you ever, I mean, there's books written on the Daniel diet. Daniel diet. Well, when you get to Colossians, let me just tell you what Colossians will tell you. Are you, are you hearing me? Your diet may make you healthier, but it will not make you holier. So let's just take a minute so we don't get confused. The reason their countenances were fairer and fatter was not because, I don't think, of their diet, but because of their determination to honor God. And God honors those that honor him. And because they refused, are you getting this? Say amen. Because they refused. Don't make it about the diet or you're going to spend your life confused. You're going to go on one of those Daniel fast and about kill yourself. <laughs> amen. I tell my wife, almost every argument I've ever known of a couple happen, having happens when they're tired or hungry. So we got a new counseling strategy around our church. Before we sit down and counsel you, you got to have a nap and a ribeye. <laughs> I promise you, 95% of your problems. Can I get some help? Can I get an amen? I mean, 95% of your problems will disappear if you get a nap and a ribeye. That's the truth. Amen. Now, now what's the point? Listen, listen carefully. I'm being silly, but what's the point? The, the point's obedience. The heart of the matter is obedience. The issue is God honors those who honor him. Because they purposed in their heart they were not going to disobey God, God honored them. And for 10 days, God intervened, and when they lined them all up, their countenance was fairer. They were sharper in their minds than all of the others, and God vindicated them. Look, just give God an opportunity to come through. Just give God an opportunity to show himself in your life, in your home, in your marriage, in your work. Who's listening? Say amen. God's favor was on them. God honored them. Daniel is being used by God to influence the culture and change the culture. Let me give you the fourth principle. We're almost finished. Who's still awake? Say amen. There's examination. Now notice verse 18. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. So now this is three years because we're told earlier they were put into this school for three years 
as their minds were trying to be altered by this culture and by this society. So at the end, now they're being examined, and they come and they stand before Nebuchadnezzar. Do you see him? And, and he's giving them a test. It's obviously a, a verbal test, and they're, they're standing before one another. Can you imagine these boys standing before the king? Can you imagine these boys at that time standing before the most powerful man on the earth? Man, they've been infiltrated. Their names have been changed. They've gone through this school. They've learned about the law and the language, and they've learned science, and they've learned astrology and all of the things that they were taught in the Babylonian culture. And now all of a sudden they stand before Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar begins to test them and examine them, and it is determined as he's testing them that their head and shoulders above all of the magicians, all of the astrologers, you see, Nebuchadnezzar had these magicians and astrologers that were in his courts, and he would rely on them to interpret dreams, and he would rely on them to give him help, and he would rely on them as his counsel. And so here's Daniel and his three friends. They go to school, probably graduated top of their class. They got the job done, probably got straight A's. They excelled, and now they're standing before the king. You, you say they were so much wiser, so much smarter because they went to school. No. No, they were so much wiser and so much smarter because of the favor of God on their life. Is anyone in the room? There's nothing wrong with education. Get all of it you can get. But I'm telling you, there's a lot of people in our culture educated beyond their intelligence. There's a lot of people. Hey, can we say it? Is it okay that we say it? Is it all right? You, you want me to? You do? You got my back? Uh-huh. Yeah, say it, preacher. There's a lot of people in this culture educated in debt up to their eyeballs with their education, still living with mama, in their boxers till noon playing video games. Can I get some help from anyone in the house? Mm. The average 18 to 35-year-old male spends more time playing video games than teenagers. Hello. Hello. I tell Keely, number one, you need someone saved. Number two, you need someone filled with the Spirit. Number three, you need someone that'll work. Why, Daddy? Because you like stuff. <laughs> you have expensive taste, honey. And in order to get stuff, it's going to take something called M-O-N-E-Y. And in order to make M-O-N-E-Y, you have to W-O-R-K at a J-O-B. I'm spelling so as to not offend some people. Who's listening? Say amen. So, baby, you like stuff. And in order to get stuff, yes or no? Can anyone help me out? In order to get stuff, it's going to take money. In order to get money, somebody's going to have to work. They're going to have to have a job. They're going to have to get up early. They're going to have to go to work. And so I'm just telling you, uh, if that one doesn't want to work, that one's not for you. Because daddy's looking forward to one day spoiling these grandkids. Can I get an amen from anyone? And when I do, <laughs> I'm not going to do like the rest of you, always talking about them. Always. <laughs> Don't you know it's going to be torture? Yes or no? Say amen. <laughs> so the king <laughs> surrounded himself with these people. But when Daniel stood before him, he said, wait a minute, something's different about this guy. And ten times over and above the others, they stood out. Verse 20 says, in all manners of wisdom and understanding. Go to Babylonian college. Graduate top of your class in Babylonian college. And it does not mean you'll have wisdom and understanding. You may have knowledge. You may have degrees. But it does not mean you'll have wisdom and understanding. And as Daniel stands before him with his three friends, they all stood head and shoulders above the others. Let me ask a question. Wouldn't that be a way we could impact our culture? Wouldn't that be a way we could make a difference? Can I tell you what people have told me before? You've heard it. I've had business owners tell me, unfortunately, preacher, I don't like hiring Christians. Why is that? Well, many of them are lazy. Many of them whine and complain. Many of them work harder getting out of work than they do working. Many of them use their faith as a crutch and as an excuse not to work. Wow. Is that true across the board? No. But one is too many. 
And I'm just telling you, we ought to be different. And you're not going to impact this culture being the same way they are. I tell teenagers, whenever I speak to teenagers, there's two rules for getting a job and keeping a job. You ready for it? Number one, show up. Number two, shut up. If you'll show up, quit calling in sick, show up, especially in this environment, right or wrong. If you'll show up, you'll probably be running the place in six months. (laughs) Thank you, Brother Jerry. Thank you, Brother Jerry. Good stuff. Amen. Let me ask you a question. Do you, do you want to be a thermometer or do you want to be a thermostat? Do you want to just let Babylon infiltrate you or do you want to change Babylon? Daniel changed his culture. Daniel made a difference. You can as well. Let me give you the last principle and we're finished. Verse 21. There's exaltation. The Bible says, after telling us in all manners of wisdom and understanding, the king inquired of them, he found them to be ten times better than all of the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. We're told the last verse, verse 21, that Daniel continued even into the first year of King Cyrus. Seventy years he was there. Chapter 1 is just an encapsulation of his life. He went there as a young teenager. It ends 70 years later. And while this Babylonian culture sought to infiltrate and control him, he made a difference And by the providence and grace of God was promoted to second in command of the most powerful empire. I'm thankful for church. I'm thankful for my church. I'm thankful for church. Let me say it again. I'm thankful for church. But I want you to hear me. God's called you to serve him where you are, in the marketplace. That's where you can make the biggest difference. Thank God for people that serve in church, and every one of us should. Thank God for all of us being committed to our church. But this is not the end. When we leave, we enter our mission field. And the place you've been called to go to school, to go to work, the ball team, that is your pulpit that can be used to impact the culture that is around you. You have the opportunity to be a thermostat and not a thermometer. You have the opportunity to change the temperature and not just register it. How do you do it? Purpose in your heart like Daniel. You're not going to compromise and defile yourself. Be nice. Be kind. Don't be a bull in a china shop. Don't think that it's your job to go straighten every lost person out. Just try hard to keep yourself straight. Live the gospel. Live the truth. You don't have to make a fight out of everything. When people around you say things that you don't agree with, are you guys listening to what I'm saying? Say say amen. A few years ago, um, um, you know, I, I moved into town and, and, and I wanted to find out where all the eating places were. And so I quickly found the people in our church that know how to eat. And I said, tell me where to go. And because Brother Allen goes to chicken salad chick, I don't take his advice. Who knows what I mean? But, <laughs> but uh, Sorry. I'm sorry, Fancy Nancy. Forgive me. I'm so sorry. So, uh, come on now. Help me out. Amen. (laughs) So, uh, (laughs) early on, I was told about this steakhouse in Leona. You've gone, huh? I mean, we were only here two weeks. I said, Julie, load up. We're going. We're going. And so, we drove We'll drive for food. When people talk to me about, you know, I don't want to drive a long distance to church. Oh, stop it. You'll drive an hour to get a good meal. Don't talk to me about driving to go to church. And so we're in line. I mean, we're in line waiting on the doors to open. Yes or no? That's commitment. I'm standing there talking to people around me. 
And there's this guy, he's got his six pack of beer. He's so excited. I said, what you got there? He said, I got my beer. It's BYOB. I'm just letting him talk. I don't yell at him. I don't cuss. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? And this is the God's honest truth. If I'm lying, I'm dying. After we were talking about 10 minutes, he goes, what do you do? I said, oh, it doesn't matter. (laughs) He said, no, tell me, what do you do? I said, I'm a pastor. Really? What you got behind you back there, man? I mean, you know. Now, my job's not to condemn. My job's not to condone. My job's just to confront. And at the end of the day, not everything is an argument that needs to be had. God didn't call me to set the world straight. God called me to keep myself straight and to try to encourage as many of us as will listen to be difference makers. And I'm just telling you, we're in Babylon, folks. And you can curse the darkness all you want to curse the darkness. See, let me tell you what I know, and then I'm going to close. All right? Let me tell you what I know. I've been around this place not long from now, be four years. All right? You're getting to know me. They say it takes five years to become the pastor. So um, how about we just all agree we'll do it in four? (laughs) Amen? Amen? All right? So I want you to hear me. I'm getting to know you. I'm getting to know you. And I'm going to tell you, some of us in this room would be something else without Jesus. No, no, no. Let me rephrase it. All of us would. And the way I know it is because most of us are something else with Jesus. Preacher, I don't like what's going on in our culture. Hey, guess what? I don't either. I don't either. I I get amazed every year. Uh, I did not watch the Super Bowl this year, not because I was protesting, but because I was doing something else more important. And um, but every year, Christians get on social media and just rant and rave about the halftime show. And what I want to say is, the only surprise is you're surprised. They're not inviting the triumphant quartet to do the halftime show. Can you say amen? (laughs) Right or wrong? It shouldn't surprise you when people in Babylon live Babylonian. It should surprise you when the people of God live Babylonian. If we're going to make a difference, we're going to have to be different. And by the grace of God, we're going to have to purpose in our heart. Preacher, what's going to happen the next three years and five years? I don't know. Preacher, what's going to happen with all these shortages and all that? I don't have a clue. Preacher, it's manipulated. Okay. And if it is, we're not doing too well stopping it. But what I know is this. He's in charge. He's in charge. And so we're just going to have to make up our mind That by the grace of God, we're going to purpose in our heart. We live in Babylon, but we're not going to become Babylonian. You want us to go to school? You want to change our name? Okay. Okay. But we're not going to disobey God. That's where we draw the line. And we don't have to be mean about it. We don't have to be ugly. This is just the way it's going to be. And all the people said, "Amen." amen. Heavenly Father, for your glory and honor, I ask you in Jesus' name to let the truth just really sear our heart today. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to you and help us, Lord, to leave the results to you. And so, Lord Jesus, do what only you can do to your glory and honor is my prayer in Jesus' name. Now, with heads bowed and eyes closed, would you stand to your feet, please? In this room are people who have put their faith and trust in Christ Jesus. And while we take just a moment to pray and listen to the Spirit of the Lord as he speaks to our heart today, If you've put your faith and your trust and your confidence in the risen Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you know him, hear me very well. You're never going to be at home in this world. Jeremiah wrote to these people, and in Jeremiah 29, isn't that interesting? He said to the people that were taken into the Babylonian captivity, I want you to buy land. I want you to build houses. I want you to settle down. I want you to get married. I want you to have children. 
What was Jeremiah telling them? Jeremiah was telling them, God's allowing you to be brought into Babylon. Babylon, And while you're there, work for the betterment of Babylon because if it prospers, you prosper. That's what he told them in Jeremiah 29. But while you're there, don't allow Babylon to control you. And folks, that's the same message all these years later for you and me today. We're in the world, but we're not of it. We're thermostats, not thermometers. We're in Babylon, but we're not Babylonian. And that's what Daniel's teaching us. And it's got to begin with a commitment in our heart that by the grace of God, we're not going to defile ourselves. We're going to be faithful to the Lord. Boy, later on as we go through Daniel, we're going to see this repeated again and again and again. They're told to bend and to bow. And if they, not, if they don't, they're going to burn. They didn't do it. And let me ask you this. You believe God intervened? He sure did. And what he's done for them, what he's done for others, he'll do for you today. The battle's the Lord's. It's not your battle. Don't live your life stressed out trying to fight everything. Just give it to the Lord and trust him that if you'll do what's right, he'll take care of the results. We're going to spend a few moments at this altar in prayer. Maybe today you'd say as a believer, you just need to come and pray about a burden in your heart today, a heavy heavy burden about a need you need prayer you need someone to pray for you or pray with you or you just want to get alone at the altar by yourself and pray about a need or a struggle in your life today you come come on maybe you need to come with a family member or a friend and pray maybe you want to pray for something or pray with someone or someone pray with you maybe today you'd say preacher God's moving on my heart to move my life to this church family you come come on maybe some would say is Brother Larry encouraged after baptism today, maybe you need to be scripturally baptized and you want to come today and say, I need to be baptized. Come on. Maybe today you'd say, preacher, there's never been a time when I've given my life to Jesus and I'm not able to say, if I died, I'd go to heaven. I want you to know there's good news. Jesus Christ, God's only son, died for you, gave his life for you on a cross, was buried and arose again the third day and with outstretched arms stands waiting for you to come and to trust him. You can be forgiven you can be saved. You can have peace. So if you need to be saved today, if you need to move your life to this church family, if you need someone to pray with you or pray for you, if you need to come get on the altar and just pray, maybe you just need to come, child of God, and like Daniel, in your heart say, Lord, I purpose in my heart that in the middle of Babylon, I want to be a difference maker. I don't want to allow the culture to control me. I want to influence the culture with the gospel. We're going to sing. The altars are open. You come on. You come on. We'll be here to pray for you. We'll be here to pray with you. Let's obey the Lord in these moments as we sing.
Jesus, we love you. We love you. We love you. And Lord, as your word says, we lift up holy hands. Nothing holy about our hands. We're just simply acknowledging, Lord, as best we know, there's nothing between our heart and yours today. And we honor you and we worship you and we adore you and we thank you. It is a privilege to be able to gather together in your name. It's such an honor to be in your presence. We are so bombarded every day by many other voices and the noise of the world and of the enemy. And it is a blessing to be able to come aside in these moments and worship you and honor you and love on you and hear from you and receive from you. And I'm asking you today in the name of Jesus to strengthen every individual, every home, every family, every marriage, every couple, every student, every child, every teenager, every widow, every widower, every person in this room. As we have sung today, our help comes from the Lord. And we turn to you, not to this world, but to you. Help us to know the balance between living in this world and not being of this world. And Lord, keep us focused on you and on your spirit. We love you, we bless you, we adore you in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen.